and I'm live and you are here with live with Joan and we're live um, okay so we are in a marathon I feel like I'm on a marathon right Claudia yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best marathon ever and so we've been in the series of how to help animals and then we've done a micro series within the series on wildlife and the other day we had linda tucker of the white lions we had jenny atkinson from the whale museum to talk about orcas yesterday we had leif cox from australia to talk about orangutans and today we have wecliffe and he is an amazing guide and just an unbelievable resource in kenya actually he's in Amboseli park right now and we're going to ask him all kinds of questions. If you're new to me, my name is Joan Ranquet. I'm an animal communicator, author, TEDx speaker, and founder of Communication with All Life University. And the school is a program for people that can learn animal communication or become an animal communicator. They can learn energy healing for animals or become an energy healer. And we have the nature and wildlife part of the school just coming out. So it's a full program uh, and we keep adding things to it and you can do little bits at a time or you can, you can do the big program. And I wanted to say where we weren't going to announce it for another week or so, but you know, we usually take new people into the school in the spring or the fall and we are just weeks away from the spring. So if it's something you're interested in any part of it, please get on a call with Shannon uh, at info at joanranquette.com. So please uh, reach out to her. She's uh, an unbelievable wealth of information about the school. She went through the school the first year and went out and worked as an animal communicator and an energy healer and still does, but came back to the school to teach. Um, so she's really, if anybody knows, everything other than Claudia, but Claudia's roped in over here, um, helping me on this. So anyway, we have lots of fun things coming up. We have the spring intensive, which is animal communication for three days, uh, EFT, emotional freedom technique, tapping for three days. We have, um, then we have animal communication and healing in sanctuaries. So this is very timely that we're talking about all wildlife and what happens if they can't make it in the wild. Um, you know, we've talked to a lot of people about sanctuaries this week and that's, we, isn't it fun when we do the sanctuary work, Claudia? Oh, it's, I love, well, I can't say it's my favorite because there's so many things that are my favorite, but the sanctuary work is, is up there. All, all, yeah, pretty much one of my favorite things. Yeah. It's amazing. And we we're actually now going to make it part of the school. We're going to have longer term online courses with that as well. But, um, and you can do the spring intensive live or we have one live spot left, one live spot left. And we have, uh, or you can do it virtually. And then we have animal communication level one coming up on April 27th for 12 weeks online. And we have, um, and that's an amazing course. It's the foundational course. I hop in there every now and then. I teach twice, but um, it's wonderful teachers in the school. And then uh, in May 12th, we start Energy Healing for Animals again. We just finished that um, two nights ago, two days ago. So um, anyway, we have lots of stuff happening. So I want to bring on the guests. Claudia, do you want to go ahead and introduce him? Absolutely. We clip Odera is a fully trained and qualified FGASA, which stands for the Field Guides Association of South Africa. He's a field and trails guide by eco-training eco -training, with extensive experience in hosting international safari guests. Born and raised in Western Kenya around Lake Victoria, he developed a love for nature at a very tender age. As a child, he spent time digging into termite mounds to try and understand the sophisticated engineering of them and loved listening to the voices of singing birds in the mornings. Mm. Wycliffe has specialization training in bird identification, botany, zoology, geology, history, evolution, 
and loves creating guided experiences that have his clients saying, wow. Hmm. He has worked with high-end clients, hosting and assisting expedition leaders with Hmm. day-to-day operations Hmm. to ensure guests get the best and most memorable experiences. He has been lucky to work with some of East Africa's top guides like Paul Kirui and Paul J. Hicks of Wild and Crazy. Has guided clients for natural habitat adventures, geographical expeditions, and born free safaris. And has hosted private groups in in and beyond Kichwa Tembo, Tembo Camp, Little Governor's Camp, and David Sheldrick's Trust, Ithumba Hill Camp. He is a member of the Kenya Professional Safari Guides Association and Fields Guide Association of South Africa, both very keen on wildlife conservation and ecotourism. In his free time, he enjoys bird watching and looking after his farm. And I'm going to bring him on now. Hello. Hello. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. So I've been lucky enough to be on a trip with Weeklip, and it was... He is a wealth of knowledge and has the most, um, just really excites everybody about everything he sees. So I'm really grateful for the experience and we're going to have another experience. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, how did you, so you loved termites and bird calls. Um, What made you, did you think you wanted to go into something with nature and wildlife when you were little? So when when I was very young, I never knew that this would be a job for me. And people would think that I'm crazy because whenever you're trying to like follow uh, little little things in the ground, then they don't really understand what's going on. So there was really no one to mentor me, and there was no one to like show me the right way. But later on, then when after I finished college, and then I found the right people, then they mentored me, and I became who I am today. What did you study in college that you thought you were going to maybe be? So my first course was hospitality, and that was uh, food and beverage sales and service. And then my second course was uh, information technology. And then after that, then I got into uh, tourism. And that's when now I started taking everything seriously. And that's when I went to South Africa to do further training and also some other trainings within the country here. That that training through the Fagasa is seems like it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, and you learn everything from, you really do learn everything about the land from every bug to every, and so you, I mean, the one thing I would say is your knowledge of an ecosystem is unbelievable. And I love that. So now what do you do with, you you mostly guide? Yeah, so now I work on different, very different projects here and there. And uh, like right now I'm on a tour. I have been in Aboseli for over a month now. The whole of February I was here. And now this is like the first week of March. I'm still here. So I'm working for Disney's. Disney Plus, we are uh, producing a documentary, but it's going to come out soon enough. So that's just part of what I do. And apart from that, I do take out guests. And I I try to um, try to put in the information and try to be the interlink between nature and people who love nature so that they can be a change and they can also spread the good information out. When you um, <clears throat> when you think about things like um, what what is a, I mean you're out there every day, right? So, yeah. what what do you see as um, one of the bigger threats to our ecosystem? Well, um, nature in itself is a very complex thing, and the ecosystem it's just part of it, and which if you really want to take care of it, then you need to look into small things like you'd start from grasses, you'd look at termites, you'd look at uh, soil texture, how does it look like, is it really open, is, is there any erosion going on, all these things. And the, the biggest threat that we have right now, say for example in nature places like Amboseli here, is uh, 
encroachment into wildlife areas and people are, uh, are bringing uh, trying uh, farming because uh, say for example Mboseli is just in the foot of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro which is very fertile the soil around is so fertile uh, because it's it's a volcanic soil Volcano. so yeah yeah because of that people are beginning to create farms and that is a, a to me that is a really huge threat because every day the park gets smaller and smaller and then it means that the wildlife remain with nothing so at the end of the day the carrying capacity for this park is going to be really minimal and that will mean that uh, the animals will not breed naturally and they will start dwindling in numbers and then we will get things getting wiped out mm. yeah and in uh, kenya doesn't allow trophy hunting is that correct no kenya kenya doesn't do trophy hunting but then we have a poaching problem. Poaching right. is another problem in, in, in itself. So um, like um, when COVID started, then uh, tourism went really down. At, at least it wasn't there for a while. So because of that, there was a lot of leeway for bad people to come into the parks and start poaching. And also there are people who are previously employed in, in the parks uh, to do different duties, different jobs. Now, because they were, their source of livelihood was, wasn't there anymore, so they started like being the people, because they know the park very well, so then they, they become a threat instead of being a protection. Boy. How has COVID affected um, the protection of animals over there? So yeah, COVID. When when COVID uh, strike, when when COVID started, uh, many people lost their jobs, and that included rangers. And uh, in Kenya, there is a lot of conserved, like conservatory conservatory areas, more than even the parks themselves. The parks that are managed by Kenya Wildlife Service, which is the government parastatal, which is uh, its main duty is to protect the parks, is not. It's not, they, they doesn't hold a bigger percentage of this. So many, many more people did, did make arrangements and then they would um, arrange with the communities around the parks and then they would lease land. And this land then they would uh, try to turn it into a uh, wildlife area. So then they would employ people from these communities to be the rangers to protect this wildlife which is in their land. When, when COVID started their source of livelihood went away because there were no tours and you know when there's tourism then it means that there's a source of income that keeps the system going but when there was no source of income then all these people become became jobless uh, now uh, there was an influx of uh, bushmeat hunting which uh, is mainly for sustenance for people who think that they should be eating uh, the bushmeat and then with that then people do graduate to different things and you would find that there's uh, um, people convincing them to go and try to uh, poach elephants because that's a it's, a it's a syndicate it's never done by a single person so you need like uh, somebody inside who knows the area really well and they know the movement of the animals they know the movement of the wildlife in this particular area so these people became a very good candidate for this kind of jobs when they didn't have their source of livelihood, which was so unfortunate. So did poaching go up? Yeah, to some, to some extent, yes. Uh, we had um, a lot of poaching, though not in, you would say not like, um, not like people targeting specific animals like elephants, but there was poaching for bushmeat. So these were small animals like antelopes dig digs, these small, small animals, and they would poach this bush meat, they would lay snares, and you know, whenever snares are laid, snares do not choose what they are going for. They can kill anything, right. they, can do, they can do damage to anything. So when these people go out and lay snares, then it's not only danger to the small animals that they are targeting, it's danger to everything that lives within the, the ecosystem. Right. Yeah. Um, when, so, Tell me about the, <clears throat> what is a syndicate that would want 
to poach elephants? So, um, elephant poaching and maybe rhino poaching is uh, it's always a well organized syndicate, which uh, means that there are several people that is involved in the system. There's always the the, the smallest guy who is at the the lowest uh, step of the food chain. And this is the guy who would be given a gun or a rifle to go and kill, to go and shoot the elephant or to go and put in the snares. This is someone who is just poor and is looking for something to keep him going for the day. Then right. there, there would be a middleman who is going to transport uh, the ivory to wherever destination the final person is going to take it to. So once it's uh, been taken by the top people, then that's now they start making arrangements on how to take it out of the country. So it's like a, it's a system that is properly organized. And usually when you catch when you catch a poacher, you will always catch the, the little guy. You'll never catch the top guy because they're never there. They, they don't show up. Right. So they pay a small amount to the, uh, the guy at the bottom. And he does all the dirty job. And then them their work is to take the ivory and go with it. So in, in occasions, in a few occasions whereby they get caught at the airports when they're trying to sneak it out, that's good. But when it's just happening within the country, then sometimes it's so difficult to detect it. And then where does the ivory go? Well, ivory has got uh, a big market in Asia. In Asia, because... Um, People believe that uh, ornaments made from made, ornaments made from ivory are really cool, so they think that you should have it, which is unfortunate. And again, um, same same Asia do believe that if you drink a concussion from rhinoceros horn, then you get like powerful like the rhino. So all all I would say all wrong information and people getting brainwashed in the wrong way but there's no one to tell them the truth there's no one to like give them the correct information so it's still out there and you see that thread you know yeah so tell me what is a um a rhino horn made of isn't it similar to what our yeah so rhino horn is just like a compacted hair and hair you know very well that is uh, just keratin like our nails, our fingernails, or just our hair, but mm -hmm. it's just compacted. Like you take uh, several strands of hair and compact them under pressure, then you you end up with something that is kind of solid. But in real sense, it's just the similar. It's the same thing that we have. It's not any any form of magic or any form of special thing. And the problem is also that they don't realize. I think that the people that think that they're getting a magic potion also don't understand the reality of these animals going extinct. Yeah, unfortunately, human beings for us, most of the time, we, we always think of the money and we don't think of the impact. We don't think of what, what will happen beyond this. So say, for example, if somebody comes and promises me uh, a good amount, amount that I would think is good, then I would agree to like participate in this thing, not knowing that when whenever I'm doing this, then it means that you are affecting the population of this particular species. So again, uh, it's greed and it's a lack of information. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you, um, so does ecotourism have an impact on animals? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, take it this way: when you come to visit an area, any any in any part of the world, you are going to pay a fee. You are going to pay a conservation fee. You are going to stay somewhere, and there will be people looking after you. So you are going to be spending money, and you are at the same time there are people who are employed who are getting your money to uh, run their day-to-day -day life. So these people are engaged, they are busy, they are not thinking of anything uh, evil. Again, when you pay the conserv uh, conservation fee, it means that um, the management is going to 
pay people to look after the animals. They are going to pay rangers to patrol. They are going to pay anti-poaching units to just see whatever is going on in these particular areas. But when people don't travel, when you stay in the same place and maybe you only see things uh, on the social media, the money doesn't go directly mm -hmm. to the conservation area. So it means that they are not making any profits. So not not profits, but they are not raising any funds to keep the system going. So, to keep it going, yeah. 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 Um, so one of the things, I mean, can we talk a little bit about the Sheldrick Trust? Yeah, so um, the Sheldrick uh, Trust is one of the organizations that uh, was founded to um, like um, address the issue of um, elephants, often baby elephants. So what normally would happen is that uh, when, when there's severe drought, elephants would be looking for water. And during this period, if they had young calves, then sometimes they do fall into the wells. Sometimes they do fall into the water holes. And then the mother cannot get them out. So these babies would suffer, and at the end of the day, they would die. So then uh, Sheldricks, David Sheldricks, who was, uh, he was the warden of Savo East National Park, at that time, he thought of an idea. And together with his wife, uh, the late Daphne Dem uh, Sheldrick, they thought of an idea of how they could uh, intervene on this issue. And then later on, when David had passed away, then uh, Daphne uh, started it in the memory of, of her husband. And then uh, she started with rescuing the orphan elephant, but there was a big challenge because they could not figure out what kind of milk uh, would sustain these babies. Because initially they thought that it, was, uh, it would be normal uh, cow milk, but then when they tried, they realized that uh, the baby's system were not able to hold the fat in the milk. So with extensive research and trial and error for several years, they finally uh, found the perfect formula for the babies. And ever since then, it has been a very successful organization, always rescuing orphan babies, and not only from falling from wells, but from even poaching, anything, anything that would interfere with the uh, mother they would come in and rescue the baby and just make sure that they still survive and they would introduce them to a nursery where they are rest for about four years that is in nairobi and after about four years then they transfer them to itumba camp itumba area which is in the Savo east and that's, and that's where we went yeah that's where we went so they would take them to this place and start reintroducing them back to the wild again it's a process that takes a while it's going to take another four years. So they have these elephants in their care for about eight years. It's a long time. So, yeah. yeah. So what is amazing is that they, they walk those, so the they're juveniles, they're not babies, right? So they, they take them out on big walks and mm -hmm. they can meet up with the wild or they can yeah. go back home. Yeah, it's the coolest process on the planet. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and when you when you go to this place and watch them, you get to be there for the morning, the lunch, and the evening feeding, and it's just absolutely magical to be with them. Yes. And then what else is around around there? Because that's the that's East Savo, is that right? Yeah. So Savo East, it's a it's a beautiful, it's a really beautiful landscape, and uh, it's a uh, both Savo Savo East and West um, together combined, they form an area of about twenty two thousand square kilometers, which is the largest um, wildlife area in Kenya as a whole. So you can imagine, the, yeah, you can imagine the amount of wildlife you could see in these places, and it's just amazing because it's a, it's a very undisturbed area and it's a very well protected area, and all thanks to visitors, people who come and spend their money, your money goes back to um, ensuring that these places are protected and they stay wild the same way they are. One of the things that I've I've noticed on 
trips that just blows my mind is how habituated certain animals are to us humans. Um, what do you think they think of us? Uh, I think animals, I think uh, just like human beings, they have different personalities and they can read you. Same way we can read them, they can read you. And uh, I remember during our trip, you remember we had a stop and there was a bush baby that kept on staring at us and coming yes. close and coming close and close and close. And we spent like more than half an hour in, in this place just spending time with this particular bush baby, which is not normal. It doesn't happen every day like that. So I think... Uh, that's what made you believe in animal communication. <laughs> that's when I believe in animal communication. And I, I, would, I would want to say that uh, <clears throat> same like with dogs that we keep at home, um, you find that when somebody who is not uh, of good manners or somebody who does have like uh, dodgy behavior, whenever they come to our compounds where we have the dogs, they would bark a lot. But then if somebody who is good and well-behaved and well-mannered come in the same place, then they just quiet and they will welcome them, wiggling the tail and sniffing them. So I think animals can read us very much. And I think they also understand, they can tell when we mean danger to them or when we mean good to them. And that that's one reason, like I see these, all these different um, groups and they're so loud. I'm, I'm like, let's be quiet and just be with them. Yeah. Do you think it makes a difference? It does make a difference because even as a guide, and you remember the first rule, rule that I gave out when you guys came was that when whenever we go to a sighting, you need to keep quiet and just uh, absorb. And when you keep quiet, then you give the animal chance of uh, getting curious and just coming to you and probing and trying to understand what you are, and what, what you want. And they will come in a good way. But when you keep disturbing them, you're making noises. They also need their own peace. They need their peace of mind. And if you come to their area, you come to their space and you, all you do is making noise, then they won't like it. So, yeah. Uh, sometimes we need to just be quiet and watch. Yeah. That's my favorite thing to do. <clears throat> um, so what is... Kenya has many parks. Um, what's the difference between... Like, what is different about Amboseli and Savo? So Amboseli is a very small park. It's only about 300, um, 320 square kilometers of land, which is really small. And the amount of elephant that is in this place is just incredible. It's something that you can't believe. It's so unbelievable. And Amboseli is mostly open and dry, but there are several swamp, swampy areas that are always permanent. That has kept the wildlife in this place going on on and on and on and on and it's mesmerizing and the reason for that is because um, Boseli is just at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro and when when it's really hot then the ice on the top of of the Mount Kilimanjaro would melt and then sink down and just come out as springs these springs have a source of lifeline in this particular park aren't there a lot of flamingos there there are flamingos in this place yeah yeah and um, what, how extinct are, are, is the rhino coming back at all? Or is it, um, oops, my dog just barked at the other dog. Um, are rhinos coming back at all, or is that still just extreme extinction? There, is, uh, there has been a lot of intervention that has been put across to try and have them back, which uh, really working and all thanks to the conservation areas and um, the only uh, the only rhino that is still is still a dilemma is the northern white rhino which is in all pajeta conservancy we only have two remaining in the wild northern white and we, we got the southern white and we got the northern white so the northern white is the one that is very 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 endangered and we only have two remaining in the whole world but scientists have been trying to like uh, have them breed again, but yeah, it has been a lot of challenge. There's a lot of uh, setbacks, but 
they are making good steps and we are hoping that maybe soon enough we might be able to get a breakthrough. What are, if you were to say that, you know, some people will never be able to come over there and see animals in the wild, what do people, you know, what do guides who are with wild animals every day think about zoos here in the U.S. or around the world? Um, zoo, it's a, it's a tough question because uh, you want to think of a child, like uh, a young child that is passionate about wildlife, but they cannot come out here to see the wildlife. In that case, then we say zoos should be there. But again, you think of a zoo that has got all the African uh, mammals and somebody would go to the zoo and then they feel the satisfaction that they've seen whatever they needed to see. But it's not the reality because this animal is, is in, it's on an enclosure and they, they are very much fed and their life is all going on well. But the reality is out here on the ground. So if you really want to see the dynamics of what's happening in in, the, in nature, you really need to go out where this animal originally came from. That way you get to understand deeply than when it's in, inside the zoo. Because um, even if you look at it scientifically, you realize that all the animals in the zoos tend to stay longer than the animals in nature. And why is that? It's because the ones in nature are living their true life, which, uh, it's, uh, which includes a lot of challenges within. But the ones in, in the zoos, they don't really, their life is very much planned for them. So I don't think even us human beings would like to have a life that uh, it's controlled. No, no. Yeah. We all like our freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, I mean, a lot of times zoos have big, conservation efforts or they give money to things and research um and so it's a it's also a double-edged sword in that way too but yeah. for me i'd rather i mean there's no to see animals in the wild like you do every day is just it's beyond a gift and so how do you feel about the idea that um, like you're talking about one of the biggest threats right now is encroachment because of farming and all of that has to do with just how big our population is and people not thinking through. Um, some people say that we've really only, we've got to rewild the earth by 23% in the next 10 years or we won't, ha you know, everything will be extinct. How, what do you see about climate change there? Well, climate change is a reality that we cannot escape, and it's there and it's happening. But um, I think as human beings, we are fu fueling it, and it's happening at a very high speed. So if we could take a step back and just uh, think about it, and uh, maybe just everyone, if everyone could think the same way, and just we stop being selfish, because most of most of this of uh, this is because of selfishness of us. We only want for us and not caring about other people or other animals or other kinds of life. So if you can all just be united and think and think of the impact that we are creating with all the bad things we are doing, then I think we might be able to uh, make a change. But if that doesn't happen, because even the farms here, you realize that there are huge farms that they are commercial farms. They are not like for sustenance. So then it's another um, what I would call uh, selfishness and greed. So if we can Agreed. stop that, yeah, then I think we can make a change. Yeah. Um, are, is Claudia, are people commenting? Sorry, I have to mute myself. Uh, people are saying hi. We've got uh, people are watching. Okay. Um, so it's, it's very educational. So yes. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. I just wanted to check in because it it is amazing 
um, you know, here in the U.S., it's it's not uh, it's it's a very selfish society. Um, so it's it's hard it's hard to um, you know. I would love to scream from the top of the hills. I mean, actually, I li I am surrounded by nature, so I'm very, very, very lucky. Um, but a lot of people are not, and so it it isn't in their face to think about the grasses and the termite and the, you know, all the things that make up an ecosystem or nature. Um, so, what are some of the animals that? Uh, you love seeing when you're out there? Well, I love all the animals, but Kenya, Kenya is blessed. And uh, this is because we have, we have the equator dissecting Kenya into halves. We got the north part and then we got the south part. If you go north, there's northern species that you cannot find in the southern, in the south of the equator. So it's always a mix. And I, I always love to have a mix and just, get to see both go to both sides is um what what are the parks that are in the north so like on Pejeta conservancy where we will be visiting is in the north yes yeah but very much on the edge of equator so on Pejeta is like the ultimate uh, space because there then you get a mix of both you get the northern species and you get the southern species but then when you come down Further south, you get Masai Mara, you get Amboseli, and then uh, southeast, uh, you get Savo. So, is it primarily elephants? What are some of the animals that are in the north? Well, um, elephant definitely uh, is prominent species. And also, because elephant is very much uh, equated to human beings, they're very intelligent, they're super intelligent, and it's an animal that you can never get tired of watching. But uh, there are no. several other species that are available there lions, cheetahs, uh, oryxes, ostriches, giraffe, all, all the other animals, the zebras, they're all there, all of them. But when talking of the prominent ones, then yes, elephants, you can never get tired of. No. And then um, cheetahs are very, are there's they're becoming more and more extinct i mean i think they say there's only eight thousand or something in the wild is anything do you see cheetahs a lot there uh, yeah you do see them but um again it's another species that is very very much threatened and it's because of the loss of um, uh, habitat encroachment all this and Again, cheetah is, when you look at predators, it's the lowest on the predator line. So it's, uh, it, get, it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of threats from other predators and just from competition, all that. So that has made them really go, they've gone through a lot. And the population is uh, slightly beginning to come back, but it's still not uh, stable. And I mean, they don't. They are not even in the same category as lions and leopards. They're in, they're in a different cat category. Yeah, they are. They are slightly. They are. They are not like uh, what you you you. Uh, they're not like what you'd say. They are pure cats. They're not pure cats, because uh, if you look at the features that makes a cat, then they're slightly off that. But they are unique in their own way. And they're special and I uh, think they're cute, really cute. Yeah, I love cheetahs. <clears throat> um, has anyone, does anyone have a question? Okay, go ahead. So uh, Ellen EE -E says, it's hard to imagine the gift of being near wildlife living in the Netherlands. I love the respect in the way you talk about your work and passion. Uh, Julie Webb says, did Wycliffe say a waterfall of selfishness and greed? I so appreciate this naming of truth and his great, well-informed care. Mm. And then our fellow birder, Terry Hawk, mm. <laughs> she wants to know how many species of birds in Kenya and what's, his, what's your favorite? Uh, did you say how many species of birds? Yeah, and yes. what's your favorite? 
So in Kenya, we have about 400 different species. And um, my favorite, I think I like the saddle build stock, if she knows what that is, saddle, saddle build stock. So it's a bird that has got a really nice uh, reddish bill and uh, a yellow saddle on the nose. It's so cute and it's black and white. It's one of the stocks. <laughs> I think it's cool, that one. But we got several other pretty birds in Kenya. And depending on where you are, if you're on the north, you see the northern ones. You, when you go to the south, you see the southern ones. You come to a moseli on, on the spring, there's several water birds. You can't even begin to count. Yeah, Terry, uh, I'm gonna, you might want to come on the trip because we're going to Ambicelli and we're going to Old Pajeta and we're going to Savo to hang out with those juvenile, um, it, yeah, the juvenile elephants. And Wycliffe is your tour guide, Yeah, yes. and this is our guide. <laughs> hmm. was, which is the best guide in all of Kenya. Any other questions, uh, comments? Yeah, uh, Jane Sewell wants to know, she said, uh, because said he was filming at the beginning, just wondering what the film is regarding. Is it educational? Is what, it's a documentary, correct? Yeah, for Disney. What's the documentary about? Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say it for now, but once, uh, once, once it's ready, then I will be allowed to share it and I will be glad to share with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. All right. Well, it's been amazing to spend time with you, and I'm excited for November, end of November, December, and um, I'll be sharing more about that. And I just wanted to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for being an amazing guide, and thank you for sharing all of that with us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who was listening. And I'm only hoping that together we can make a change. We will. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.